right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, have to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Come right back toward the hole. Seventeen years later, Hal Sutton is the Players' Champion. Well, he's got it going right at the black stick. It'll be up. Yeah. It is. Hey everybody, welcome to uh, another episode of the Be The Right Club Today podcast. How, what's happening? Nothing. Uh, U.S. Open week, this will US be Open fun. Week. Yeah. Did you, um, did you, did you play a U.S. Open at Torrey? Was, was, was there no, a U.S. Open? No, I never did play a U.S. I played a lot of tournament golf at yeah, Torrey. Yeah, was it times. the, the, it was a bank tournament, right? What'd they call it though? Oh, too long ago. <laughs> I can't remember what they were your called. Your memory is pretty sharp. You know? <laughs> they change names sometimes too. Real quick, talk briefly. North South course. Like obviously, we're playing at the South this yeah. week, but yeah, South was a lot better golf course. They redid the North course. I hear a lot of great things about the North yeah. course now, but South course is a great golf course. You know, when we played, it was Buick. Open Buick. There. there you go. Yeah. Uh, but when we played there, sometimes it wasn't in the best of shape. So okay. it's typical. Uh, Poana Greens, uh, sometimes they get a little rough, you yeah. know. Um, two quick or one quick thing like that it takes to win that. I mean, obviously, certain things to win the U.S. Open, but but talk more specifically to that golf course. I know you didn't play that golf course in quite the conditions that you're going to see it, but it still played pretty tough in the Buick. What, oh, yeah. what, are, what are some things that you've got to got to do well there? Well, I think you're going to have to drive the ball really well there. I think you pick your places. You know, it's typical U.S. Open golf course. You don't try to steal anything from it. You yeah. wait on your opportunities. And, and uh, I mean, I preach it all the time. Winning runs into you you don't run into winning and you better not try to run into it there yeah and i'll go back to what we talked about last week with with girlene it, it, it was the epitome of what we preach here about one shot at a time and being committed and having a plan and doing all that stuff and it just gets ex- amplified at the u.s open like you if man if 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 her commitment was a little bit off and we hit it in the wrong spot i mean we're looking double or triple straight in the face and you just got to survive and at that point right and so you know everything that that you preach about the mental game and everything we've been talking about on here you've just got to got to hunker down and do that at a u.s open well you you've got to look for a way out if you hit it into a spot that you don't want to be in yeah. you got to get back to where you can play from as quickly as possible yeah. and i mean and that means sometimes that you know pars out of the question and let's just make the bogey a yep. bogey is golden at that point yep. you know freddie used to tell me all the time you know par is golden on this hole don't try to beat this yep. sometimes bogey is golden yep. and Absolutely. you know u.s open you can't win it if you're making doubles and triples any uh any feels of who might who, might, who you think might play well this week thought about it at all i haven't really thought about it yep. you know I, I hope to see an exciting u.s open i bet we do yep awesome well we've got a great guest on this week um been a friend of mine for for six or seven years now, seven or eight years now. A mentor of mine. Um, he's a uh, he's a, a a great golf instructor. One of the best instructors in the world, in my opinion. His name's Rob Holding from from um, he's over in the west side of Canada in British Columbia. Um, I met Rob and went up to his academy when I was working for My Swing 3D Motion Capture Company back in the day, and um, just learned a lot about. Uh, the way he teaches and his his system and his academy and all that stuff and um, you know I was telling Hal off air like he's he's one of the one of the few coaches out there in my opinion that really has has it all from a teaching and coaching perspective there's a lot of golf swing instructors there's a lot of coaches out there that can coach the game there's there's very few in my opinion that that have played at a high level and can also coach the game at a really high level and Rob is Rob is one of them I really uh, when I met Rob a few years ago at the uh PGA show, I felt like we connected because we thought a lot alike. And, uh, you know, after doing the podcast, 
uh, I really feel like there's many things that he and I believe the same way. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he talks about on here a lot is uh, being focused and dedicated and you can't make it in golf if you're not. Yeah, correct. correct. Y'all enjoy it. It's good. Our next guest on the Be The Right Club Today podcast is Mr. Rob Holding. Rob and I met about six or seven years ago. I was working for my swing, uh, came up to to Canada to his academy, and uh, you know I've been very impressed. Um, I would consider Rob a, a mentor. He's one of the best instructors in the world. Um, his academy, the Rob Holding Performance Golf Academy in, in British Columbia, always ranks number one in golf academies from a performance standpoint in the, uh, in the Canada and in, in all of Canada. So Rob, super excited to have you on board, um, or, or on, on the podcast and, uh, super excited to, to learn from you as always. So thanks for coming on and, and, and welcome to the be the right club today podcast. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really flattered to, to be here, especially, uh, with Mr. Sutton. I met him at the PGA show and, uh, we hit it off pretty well, uh, uh just uh yeah so let's be the right podcast today <laughs> <laughs> well rob thank you very much for coming on and yes we did meet and uh, i enjoyed your presentation that day and uh, uh look forward to finding out more about what you do so uh you've got one of the most successful golf academies in the world what's your secret uh i don't know oh, well i i <laughs> I, I think I, I think if I had to answer that in a very simple way, it's focus. Uh, it's focus on the individual. Uh, I don't do group lessons. Uh, I don't think I've done a group lesson in over 20 years. Uh, I, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we're selective with the people that work with us. Uh, we look for commitment from the family and we look for commitment from the students. If I sense at all that there's not a commitment there, then we replace them with someone that is more keen. So if you have highly motivated students, you can make a coach look pretty good. Uh, if you've got a highly motivated coach as well, it stays up to speed with the latest uh, in learning ideas and technology. And uh, uh, plus I had a lot of my own experiences bringing to the table. You're, you're creating a good environment for people to develop it. Uh, and it's then from there, it went to adding, you know, gradually adding more teachers, finding the right fit for uh, how to let the, uh, the instructors do their own thing within uh, uh, good guidelines. You know, uh, 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 as you know, if you asked 500 different golf teachers out there uh, to look at a golf swing, you would get 490 different observations. <laughs> and that can be very confusing for, for students and uh, uh, and for parents, too, who are observing that, that type of problem. Uh, so gradually, uh, we've, we've got a formula that, that works. Uh, typically, a student will come uh, once, twice, or three times a week, depending on their age and their level uh, of competitiveness. Uh, the, our usual program is you would have an hour of instruction that could be half hour with a putting coach and a half hour with a swing coach. It could be one hour with the same coach, depending on the, the person. Uh, and then afterwards, in most cases, they will take an hour of fitness. So it's kind of a one-stop shop. We have a, a, a large gym upstairs. Uh, we have a full-time trainer. And basically every hour we're turning over uh, uh, new people into the gym that are coming from, from the golf. Some do fitness first, but we don't like that too much. It's usually they get a little too tired for the golf lesson, uh, unless you're Tiger Woods, you know. But <laughs> so, so I don't know that answers your question, but uh, uh, we, uh, I think another big difference in our program is that we're actually on the golf course supporting the kids during tournaments in, in a lot of the cases uh like if i we have typically we'll have tournaments on weekends here uh which can kick the heck out of my schedule so instead of taking a day off i go to watch them play and you really find out what's going on when you do that and i think you're kidding yourself if you don't uh if you don't watch what your students are actually doing on the golf course and i realize it's hard right it's hard for teachers to do that i, I have two guys that are a PGA tour cards now that I started when they were one was five and the other one was 11 and sorry 15 and uh 
I probably, well, I didn't spend a lot of time with them on the golf course. Uh, they were playing very well. They didn't really need me to watch them, but uh, uh, looking back, that that's one of the ways the program has changed quite a bit. Yeah. Rob, how do you, you mentioned focus um, with all the kids you work with and, and we talk about it all the time with all the distractions they have. How do you keep, how do you keep your kids, you know, completely, completely locked in? Well, um, it's interesting, but you know, if you, if you were to take a kid at eight or nine, uh, one of the things that we look for when we're bringing people in in the first place is can they pay attention? Can they focus for more than a minute? Uh, lots of kids can't. That's fine. That's normal. Uh, what we're looking for are the ones that can. Uh, golf lessons are expensive. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we, uh, we, you know, I, honestly, as a business, I look at it like this person is a, an asset to my business. It's an asset to me personally. I'm going to be with them for a long, long time. So you got to nurture it. You got to take care of it. Uh, and uh, if the like, I, I'm just very upfront with people. I'll just say to the kid, or I'll tell the parent, "Look, you're not you're not focusing. You're not paying enough attention. This isn't a joke. This isn't a classroom. You're in a competition against other kids. You're fighting for a scholarship, or you're fighting for a spot on your high school team. You you need to pay attention because your competition is, you know, and." Uh, uh, I don't, you know, we don't mess around. It, you know, I understand people have a lot of things going on. That's great. Then golf may not be for you right now. Go away. <laughs> do something else. Don't waste my time. Don't waste your time. Don't do this because your parents want you to. Do this because it's a challenge to you and something you want to do. So that sounds pretty harsh to a lot of people. But I'm not looking, I'm not looking for the 99%. I'm looking for the one percenter. That's the secret to my success is that I've surrounded myself with the best students I can and the best teachers I can and the best mentors I can. And, uh, you know, I'm in a different world, I realize, than a lot of people. And I didn't get there overnight. I've been doing this 28 years now. Uh, and 21 of it has been focused on, on high performance uh, uh, junior golf. Rob, what's the youngest student you'd take? Seven. Seven. I mean, personally, now uh, they'd have to be a pretty exceptional seven-year-old. But um, I, I would. I, we bring kids into the academy at around age seven. Uh, we've done it at five and six, uh, but it's like babysitting a lot of the time. And uh, uh, there's been a couple of, you know, Michelle, who's probably our my my all-time best student. Uh, I started her at six, and if you saw her in the first lesson, you'd you probably wouldn't think there, there was going to be a success. She was literally falling on the ground. She'd had golf lessons for about eight months and she'd fall on the ground after making a golf swing. <laughs> but she's the number one ranked 14 year old in the world right now. <laughs> so yeah. as far as competitive results go, I should say. Uh, right. Anyway, uh, uh, it, it, you know, sometimes you don't know how. Sometimes uh, you get surprised. Sometimes uh, they go off to their tournament and they come back and they finish third and you expect maybe they're going to finish 15th. And sometimes it goes the other way, but uh, anyway, they start to show promise. I think a big key to this is making them have, allowing them to enjoy the process and let them know that they're not being criticized and they're not failing because they're failing they're, You need to fail and learn to succeed. It's, it's, uh, you know, okay, what did you do well? I, 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 you know, I choked in the last three holes coming in and I, I went bogey, bogey, double bogey, finish. Okay, what did you do well? And, and, and I was, you know, be looking at that positive side and, and say, okay, how do you, how do you work, learn to play one shot at a time? How do you learn to stay in the present? How do you, you know, and, and gradually they, they do. And it's very, it's, it's cool. You know, they, they, uh, uh, I think the problem with group instruction is like if you, if I had say I called a meeting of of the, of the whole tribe so to speak and uh, I wanted to do a lecture on uh, the mental you know the mindset of of a tournament golfer the, the individuals in that room if I had the same speech the individuals in that room would all have a very different interpretation of what I was saying and you're probably missing the mark on eighty percent of them or ninety percent of them. You need to find a way to coach the individual in a way that that individual understands. I, I call this coaching in context to the person that you're speaking to. 
uh, uh, making sure that they understand the message. How, what is your understanding of my message? Ask a lot of questions. Uh, you'll find out that you may not be as, as good a communicator as you thought, or that your message isn't coming across the way you intended it. And that, that makes you a good communicator, is that you can, you can clarify things with people. And if you can't, uh, maybe you're trying to do something that's over their head at the moment. And, and that's okay. Uh, uh, you know, this, you have to be very patient. As you know, it takes a long time to become a really good golfer. Most people want it faster than it's possible to do. And I'm sure you find that often. I mean, one of the things that Chase and I fight in here is people wanting to go to step two, three, four before they actually even understand step one. And uh, <laughs> I know yeah. you found that same thing to be true. Sure, sure. It's, it's, uh, we got uh, lately, that's funny, but things, the demographics kind of change in, in our area and COVID has presented some interesting challenges. It's also brought about some new opportunities. Uh, and I, I'm finding myself getting uh, new teenagers. Uh, older kids and they're like 14 and 15 and they're they're shooting high 70s low 80s in tournaments and they're not that's not good enough right now <laughs> for, what, for what your goals are and the, the foundation just isn't there and you basically you know you can't build a great house on a poor foundation is a kind of you know an overused analogy but it's very true you've got to have good footwork, you've got to have good balance, you've got to have posture, you've got to have an understanding how to swing the club instead of how to hit the ball all the time. Uh, that good golfers swing at 80%, 85%, they're never really swinging at 100% until, you know, there's a big green light and an 80-yard wide fairway and it's downwind. But but most of the time, you've got to be in cruise control and in a mental, in a mental state, in a good physical state where you can feel like you're you're getting the job done without exerting, over exerting a lot of force and trusting that your ball is going to get to the green instead of at the last second, tighten up and try and steer it, you know, and, and learn how to get into that mindset uh, to, to allow yourself. But the, the technology that I use is so helpful. Like if, if I didn't have a good launch runner, we use TrackMan. And um, I get this, for example, this, this 14 year old boy came in and he was really full of tension and he's blocking shots and steering it. And uh, I, I showed him, I asked him to try to do some left handed, his right handed club, put the club in your left hand and hit the ball for me with your full swing left arm only. And that took about 15 minutes before he could actually square the face up. And I just demonstrated to him that these are good forces. I'm going to hold the club with three fingers in my left hand and I'm going to make a full swing. At, a comfortable speed, and I'm going to score it up every single time. Ball is going to go straight. I can do it with my right hand. I can do it with my left hand. They had no idea how to feel the golf club, how to control the center of mass of that club, how to feel where it is in the swing, and how little effort you could make what we might refer to as an efficiency, how little effort it actually takes to hit a good, solid golf shot straight. And uh, uh, the, the next step, of course, is will they practice that? And then the next step is will they trust that when they get into a tournament situation? And, and uh, you know, all you can do is just say, look, this is the way. This is the, this is the path. Yes, it works. It really becomes more of a mental game for you at, at a certain point than a physical game. And anyway, uh, sometimes the kid buys in and sometimes they go away. And uh, uh, because it just seems too abstract, the concept to them seems impossible. Or if you get the kid that says, "Okay, I'm in. I trust you, and I, 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 I'll listen and I'll do it." And then, then you've really got a great student, and you've got a great. You're going to have a great player. Rob, with that, sure. with that 14 year old that's behind the curve a little bit, as far as you know, you've got call it you've got college flags all over your your facility from scholarships to all sorts of all sorts of college around the country but that 14 15 year old that is averaging 78 or 79 and he's a little bit behind does your i don't know your approach speed up a little bit do you do anything different do you try to create a sense of urgency with them or hal always says you know and i think this is great you know golf's a journey with no real destination and you don't know how good you're going to get and you don't know when you're going to get to to your peak, basically. 
So is that just a kid that, you know, he might peak at 21 where, or, or, or get to the level he needs to get to the college level by 21 or 22 and he's just behind? Or do you, you know, do you speed him up and it, either you get to a point and it's like, okay, you didn't make it? Like, how, how do you approach that? Well, uh, okay, it, it's a great question. Uh, it would depend a lot on the personality of the individual, uh, how strong a person I think they might be right at the moment. I don't want to shatter them, but I also want to give them a good dose of reality. And I want the family to know as well what they're getting into. We are really good. All of us are pretty good at what we do. And uh, it's not really magic. There's a lot of hard work that you've got to put in, you know, uh, 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 to, to make it work. For example, um, I had a boy come from uh, China recently. He was on the Hong Kong national team over there. He's on the development team, really. And... Uh, the way he was sold to me and presented to me is like, he's, he's awesome. He's really good. And I, I didn't see any of his tournament scores. And then he came over here and he got into his first tournament in the spring and shot like 84. And, and then I asked him more questions and I said, well, what's, what's good score for the world? 76, 78. And where do you want to go? He wants to go to an Ivy League school. He wants to play golf. And uh, I said, okay, sit down and have a talk. <clears throat> This is what a Division I coach looks for. This is what an Ivy League coach looks for. These are what the scores look like. This is what the track record looks like between 14 and 18 years of age, uh, their scoring averages and so forth. And, and where you are today and where you would need to be to get to where you want to go, you're going to have to put in probably two to three times the amount of effort that you've been doing. You think you're really talented. And you think that it's easy for you, but your numbers are what do the talking for you when you're getting recruited. Your numbers, as far as your school marks go, he has no problem in that department, straight A students. But your numbers uh, from a college golf team standpoint are not even close to where they need to be to, to go to a, a fine school. And that's, that's, so what do you want to do about it? What can you do about it? And this particular guy goes to private school with a really heavy academic workload. And uh, that's for me, I, I see this often where uh, you basically have a life. If you want to be accomplish that goal, you're going to have a life for the next few years. And it's going to be golf and school. That's it. And if you don't do that, you won't get there. Like I can, I know a lot of the Ivy League coaches and I've, I've been, I've had dinner with them, I've had drinks with them, travel with them. They get 300 applications, you know, for, two or three spots and then they narrow it down to five and they could pick any one of the five and they'd have a good team. It is so competitive. It's crazy. And one, one coach told me they got 2,800 applications in one year. <laughs> you know, I think between the men's and women's team, there are six spots. So how good do you need to be? And I asked them the question, what, if you know this, what will you do to stand out? How will you stand out over 280 other applicants. What kinds of things do you do in your life? What kinds of things do you do at school? What do you do for your community? What kind of things would be appealing? Like, I had two kids get into Yale a couple of years ago. One on the boys' team, one on the women's team. <laughs> they, at the end of the day, they don't really care how well they golf. And they don't really care about a lot of things that people think. What they really care about is what is that kid going to do to make this university look good in the future? What are they going to do for for society and, and humanity? That's the kind of thing that will help you on your resume uh, when you show evidence that you're doing community work. You're, you maybe you started a charity. I got a, I got a 13 year old girl here who's a math whiz. She started a, a free online tutoring uh, math class. It's now got over 300 kids, you know, on a Zoom on a Zoom thing. She's she's showing um, uh, at her at her grade level how to do math and, and that looks pretty good on a resume too uh, uh so yeah so rob uh 28 years you've been doing this well i started 28 years ago um and the first really about the first seven or eight years i, I was uh teaching all a, anybody you could teach and and uh in 2000, an opportunity came up, a driving range uh, 
owner called me and said, I'd like to talk to you. And he basically said, I want you to come here and carte blanche and do what you want. You can have some stalls. You can set up an academy. And they did that. And um, I was doing 2,850 half hour lessons a year right out of the gate at that place. And so um, I, I would do um, often over 100 lessons a week. And I had two kids and a mortgage and all that. And it was great. It was, it was more than double the volume I was doing at the other place. Um, but, you know, that's that's great experience, but it's a bit of a burnout. Uh, in uh, When the winter comes around in Canada, you've got to ask yourself, you know, are you, you're in the golf business pretty much by November, weather starts getting pretty nasty and cold. Uh, November, December, January, February, you got a good five months there in British Columbia where uh, people aren't really thinking too much about golf and, uh, and nor can they play it. So I thought, well, what about looking for the more serious player, putting together a, an Olympic type program where uh, kids could come three times a week through the winter. We'll, we'll go to the gym together. We'll, we'll go to the driving range together. Uh, we'll bring in a sports psychologist. Um, uh, and yeah, anyway, that was the start of it. So we had, I, I, I did a, I went to a, I rented a theater. Uh, I, I made some announcements through the radio and through the newspaper that I was going to do a high performance golf uh, seminar free for, uh, for, for teenagers. And uh, uh, we had over 200 people show up and 14 of them signed up that night. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the start of it. And it, it went over really well. The kids loved it. They were really engaged. I think uh, there's a sense of community there too. Like they're, they're, a lot of the already good players uh, signed up in that program. People, you know, other, other kids would recognize as, oh, that's so-and-so, you know, they, they're really good. And so they felt it kind of created a culture where uh, it was competitive and it was fun in that sense. Um, I'm not sure I'm going all over the place here, but uh, uh, out of that group, um, uh, pretty much all of them were successful getting, getting college, getting into college. Uh, a couple of them tried to play professional golf. Uh, yeah. I have a girl that got into Stanford. Uh, she came to me when she was 11. Who, uh, she was already a pretty good little player um, and, and very motivated. And this is a really funny story that, uh, like when she was 15 or 16, uh, she would go in some Simtra tour events. She won one. <laughs> you know, she, she's just that way. And then uh, the last lesson I gave her before she, the day before she left for Stanford, she came to the lesson and said, Guess what I did today? And I said, What? She said, I learned to ride a bicycle. What? She's, uh, I guess, 19 at the time, right? She said, yeah, I learned how to ride a bicycle today. I said, whoa, you've never ridden a bicycle? She said, no, I've never ridden a bicycle. But why, why did you do it? pick today? She said, well, I have to ride one around Stanford because I can't afford a car. <laughs> <laughs> so this girl uh, is a, came from very average, uh, you know, living in a condo, uh, not wealthy people, and set her goal. And... Um, Ma'am, she had, she showed me her email, but she had ah, 60, 60 schools looking for, uh, based on her academics. Uh, she's not the smartest kid in the world, but uh, she does get straight A's and she, she credits her tutor and uh, which said, I wouldn't have made it without the tutor and I wouldn't have made it without you, but hard work trumps a lot of stuff. And, and uh, in that also a coach can see a work ethic and an attitude. She's Korean, and uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, that was. I'm saying this. Why am I saying that? Because uh, people don't realize if you want, if you really set those very high goals, and you're not just kidding yourself. Uh, there's an example where you're not going to have a lot of time. She has time to focus on getting good marks and playing well. She didn't date a lot. She didn't mess around a lot. She just that. She's just very focused on what she, on what she needed to do, and uh, you know, amazing. She got it done. So, Al, thoughts? You know, kids, kids need to hear these stories. They need well, to know 
You know, the parents love it when I talk about this because the parents, you know, who, who listens to their parents, right? <laughs> they'll, they'll listen to me. Well, Rob, I can tell you right now, uh, I was way more dedicated whenever I was growing up than the kids that were around me. I wanted something that they wouldn't even dream about paying the price to do. And so when you talk about uh, just golf and just school, I understand that. And, you know, so many people want so much more than that. But what you're going to get when you actually want all those other things is an average performance in all. And mm -hmm. that's you're not looking for an average performance. You're looking for the kid that wants a lot more than that. So here's my next question to you. More girls or more boys that want that? Uh, more girls. Yeah, it used to be boys. Now it's more girls. And I enjoy I enjoy it more. Like they take it more seriously. And uh, uh, it's it's also well, it's challenging for all the time. But yeah, mostly uh, mo mostly uh, uh, I, I don't know whether it's because you have a few girls that you've worked with for a while and they're dominating the local com competitive scene all the time. And so other mothers and fathers will say, well, would you help my daughter? Right. And, and at one time we had boys like Adam Svensson, Nick Taylor, uh, I, I could go on that we would get more boys when those boys were in town and those boys were playing. Next course is on PGA Tour now. He's won twice. Uh, 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 he's an influencer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I uh, in our in our particular area, how we've had uh, uh, a real growth in the Asian population and a real growth in the Asian population coming into golf. Uh, a lot of our clients are girls, young girls, and uh, and, and their mothers, and uh, they see golf as a way to help them get into a fine school, and. Uh, the great thing about these people is that they, uh, they have a tremendous work ethic. It's unlike unlike kids that I, when I was growing up, they they have no idea. Uh, uh, they don't stop. And other parents look at that and they think, well, that's no way to bring up a kid. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, that's that's your call. But in my view, they're they're doing they're hitting all the, they're checking off all the boxes. They're doing community work. They're doing the, the Michelle speaks four languages. She's 14 years old. She does debating. She does she, like she they just don't stop. And and uh, 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 you know, this brings us to a, a good a, a, an interesting point. When the seven year olds and eight year olds come along, I tell them this is a great time to, to learn how to do this. You've got a window here of about five years, six years. When you get to 13 or 14, your academic requirements are going to go right through the roof. You're going to be doing a lot more homework at night. You're, at, you're trying to learn how to be a good tournament player and putting the time and dedication into it at 14, 15, 16 and keep up with your schoolwork. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible. But if you get learn how to be a good tournament golfer, you'll learn how to control your nerves now. You'll learn you know, where you stand with the other fish in the stream then you can spend more time on school and you still know how to play golf and, and uh, you know, and it, it works out. So I think there's a big advantage to it. Uh, I, I think I live in a different world. You know, like I, I look at long-term development programs and, and I laugh because that isn't reality. This isn't what really happens today. We've got golf tournaments happening virtually every week of the year, including Christmas week. So where's the periodization? You know, where's the downtime? And, and, and uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a general idea here that we take kids in. Our program typically starts early September uh, and it will run through about two weeks before Christmas. Then we take a break over Christmas. Usually the parents go to the States to play. And if there wasn't COVID, they'd go down to Florida, they'd go down to, you know, Texas or wherever and play in, play in some events. And then they come back early January and we start up again. Uh, so that fall fall period, we we do re restructuring, rebuilding. We work on strength training, you know, speed, stability, um, and then when we get closer into the spring, uh, we work more on course and we work more on the mental side of things. Uh, so in that sense, the big picture, there's a periodization. 
going on there. But there's really, you know, they don't, there's not really a lot of downtime and, and there's not a lot of time. You can't take a lot of time off golf as a competitive golfer. You know, what can you do? You take a week off, two weeks, and then if you do, your short game's going to need some work. And it's, you, you got to keep your fingers on that golf club. Yep. So, Rob, do you think, we've talked about this a little bit, do you think there's some, when you say how hard a lot of those, you know, you mentioned some Asian Asian girls and, and families and stuff, how hard they work. To me, the, the word that comes to mind is discipline. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the cultural disciplines that, that are different with, you know, what you, you deal with up there versus just say some of the typical American kids. Well, um, all right. So yeah, if you understand the culture, um, they're growing up in a country with uh, about one and a half billion people. Let's say the parents, the parents grew up in that culture. Uh, there's a great divide between the rich and the poor. Uh, and in, in America and in Canada, uh, the kid has a lot of options. Uh, the, the, the Asian people I know call it a smorgasbord. When they grow up in Asia, uh, you, you don't get a smorgasbord. You pick something and you try and go vertically. You can't go all over the place. Like Hal was saying, you know, you, you, can't, you can have your water skiing and you can have your tennis and you can have this and that, but you're not going to be the best golfer you can be if you're spreading yourself all over the table. So what these guys are trying to say is you've got to pick something, you've got to specialize that. And they've realized that music isn't necessarily the avenue. Uh, they've realized that, you know, so golf sports is, is a great avenue for them. The downside of that is, is that we have to teach them how to be athletes in most cases before they can be golfers. Because they're 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 very cerebral people. They're not necessarily very physically active. Occasionally, you'll get you'll get a kid that was born here in Canada uh, of Asian descent whose parents get that and they have them in all kinds of things like martial arts or swimming is a big thing. That's great. Anything where where they have some ability to coordinate their movement is a is a big plus for me. And and that's. I, maybe that's a part of the success of our program is that we focus on, uh, we have a pretty good idea. We have tests that I've developed over the years where you can do a screen on a kid and they can't even hold a golf club waist high with one hand if you extended the arm up kind of thing. And, and uh, now you're trying to teach this person to swing a golf club. You're trying to teach them to have some form and they don't even have the ability to, the strength to do that. So you've got to teach them how to use the body to move with together with, with the club. Uh, and we have simple ways of doing that. Uh, uh, I could show you, or I could show how and take a 25 pound easy bar and swing it like a golf club. And if you're moving that thing in balance and you're moving it with body and arms together, it isn't much different. It's not going to swing as fast and you don't want to try to swing it as fast, but you can certainly swing it back and forth and, and, you know, require stability and, and, and uh, uh, balance. Uh, sorry, I, I'm kind of rambling there a little bit, but uh, anyway, go ahead. Well, no, you're good. One of the things that I was going to mention, and you kind of brought that up, one of the things we talked about and kind of hit it off with when I was up there with the MySwing, the 3D stuff was, and this is where Hal and I met at the PJ show was talking about this, was the arms versus the hips. And we, I was saying that, you know, we were seeing all these, a lot of girls, but all these boys too, that their arms were so slow. They were so far back behind their pivot. The hips had just ran off and left. And, and honestly, you showed me two or three drills that you use with your players, the just swinging an alignment stick and stop, stopping at impact. Like I stole that from you and I use it all the time, like just as a way to show these kids that, Hey, you know, the hips are gone and the, there's no stability. There's no, there's no core stability. And, and, and I think, I think that honestly, just your understanding of that is one of the reasons you have so much success and you've got so many kids that swing at it so well. There is uh, a lot of bullshit out there in the golf instruction world. And uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's presented uh, as cool and new. It isn't really very new and it isn't really that cool. Uh, you know, I could just picture a golf instructor uh, that was pretty good maybe 50 or 60 years ago watching some of the kids swing today and they would just shake their head. Like, what are you doing? And uh, I, look, ground reaction force has been like the flavor of the, flavor of the month sort of thing for the last couple of years. 
uh, vertical force, horizontal force, you know, angular momentum. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are, are teaching people to stomp hard in the left foot and push up and increase your club head speed without really an understanding of what ultimately is going to determine uh, a consistent path, face to path, attack angle uh, on the ball. If you're a kid and, or, or an adult and you're, you're teaching somebody to push really hard into the lead side and push up really hard, what effect is that having on the handle of the club? Is it getting to the handle of the club? Is it causing the club to release too early? Is it at a sequence? And I don't care, you can take all this stuff and you can know everything there is to know about the physics of how that club is moving, but it still comes down to rhythm, timing, and balance. It still comes down to working within your system and within yourself because there's no point in swinging as hard as you can at it because you can hit it all over the place. You know, you're, you, if you know what I, what I know about, about hitting a golf ball, uh, I'm thinking when I was playing a lot, I'm thinking I've got a two or three yard area on my carry distance with this eight iron that I need to land this ball in. And that's going to feel 95% or 85% or it's going to feel 80%. It's going to be a soft fade or it's going to be, I'm thinking about where that ball needs to land and how hard I need to hit it to get it there and what the trajectory is going to look like. And that's going to have a certain feel to that release. They're not all going to be the same. This is not you know, uh, back, backing up for a second. When all the instruction I've done for the last 20 years uh, um, uh, with good players, uh, especially the last 10 years since I've been using TrackMan, I can see the difference uh, uh, when I ask a kid, look, I want you to make a swing where you feel like you're swinging at 70% and it's a three quarter length back swing with, say, a seven iron. And they, they've already hit a bunch of shots with an overswing, swinging at 80 or 90 miles, you know, at 100%. And you show them the difference. Like, look at your consistency. Look at the, look at the direction here. When you're working within yourself, you don't, nobody asks you if you hit a six iron or a seven iron. Right? <laughs> I mean, Hal knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah to your point. To your point, Rob, I, I preach in here all the time. I was forced to swing at it hard. I didn't choose to swing at it hard. The shot forced me to do it. In today's world, every one of the kids are swinging as hard as they can all the time because speed and distance is the most important. And when it comes to playing the tour, consistency is what pays the bills. Yes, sir. And, and, and that's what you're talking about right now. Yeah, and it's uh, like if I'm a college coach, and I look at, I don't just look at whether you won the tournament. I'll, I'll dig in and I'll actually look at the three rounds or the four rounds you played. And I'll look at the individual holes you played, if I'm really serious. And I'm going to say, well, six birdies, five bogeys. Okay. Or is it, do you want to go with the person that made two birdies, and two bogeys, but that's sort of what their pattern is. And they're usually, I will shoot around 72. And occasionally they have a little breakthrough, but they never shoot 75 or 76. You know, it depends, I guess, on what you're looking for, a streaky player or a consistent player. And I think we know that both can have some success, but uh, uh, I don't know. What's your thought on that? For, as, as a former tour player, uh, uh, there are guys out there who are very streaky and they can get, get really hot for a couple of weeks and they can make some good money and they kind of fade away for a while. Well, my thoughts on this are uh, whenever I was young and dumb, uh, I may still be dumb, but I was dumber when I was young. I lacked wisdom. As I began to develop some wisdom, uh, before I developed any wisdom, I was able to go real low. And, but I was also able to blow things. Right. And, and I realized pretty quick that uh, your identity had a great deal to do with how well you played. So I started working towards being more consistent. And the more consistent I got, uh, the, the better the year went. And then uh, uh, I started telling, I, I tell a lot of the kids here a lot that I didn't have my A game, as Tiger used to call it, maybe two or three times a year. 
Yeah. And sometimes you didn't even win when you had your A game. But I spent most of my year managing what I had, whatever that was, doing an inventory. What am I doing well? What am I not doing as well? Playing into strengths, playing away from uh, weaknesses. I mean, that's that's management. And I'm sure you see that even in your players. Yeah, I think I'm glad you said this because um, uh, you can't win a tour tour event if you don't have a card. <laughs> and you, you know you, you don't get to the next year without keeping your card and, right and, and i think that i read a statistic one time i don't know whether it's true but on an average it takes a player coming into the tour five years before they get their first win uh that was i think i probably read that 15 years ago today it's maybe a little different with the, some of the talent that's come along uh, and i also read statistics where 70 percent of the people that get their card don't keep it after the first year and, and uh, you know, I, I think the tendency for people is to try too hard. And, and uh, uh, I remember when I first started trying to play as a pro, I went out and uh, uh, I was playing senior mini tour stuff down in Texas and uh, you come across a lot of characters. And, uh, you know, I came across this one guy who's, I think he was late 50s. <laughs> And he was about a half a million dollars in debt. And he'd been to qualifying school for the last seven years at, 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 at um, Champions Tour Qualifying School. And it's an amazing game that way. Like his family, is, he's taken all the money he can get from his family and he still has this dream. But he's definitely not doing the things that you know he needs to do to, to have success. I got to play with him at the, in the first, first round of qualifying school uh in california for the champions tour one year and uh, i won't mention his name but he hit the ball well off the tee hit the ball on the green short par four starting hole and he four putted to hit his first putt right off the green and oh boy here we go and and it was in his head you know <laughs> it wasn't yeah it was just in his head his putter was was not good and then this other guy told me he was the best ball striker in the world in my group but he he said his putting his putting was bad he says uh, I said, well, I tell you what, guys, um, uh, I, we all have a job to do today, and you just keep that to yourself. I'm just going to tell you one thing. You're going to need to finish all your cuts today. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and that kind of shot them up, and I could focus on my, on my job. But neither one of them, like, they just, there's demons. They have demons, right? And uh, you, that's not a good, that's not going to work. <laughs> anyway. Rob, Rob, do you think consistency exists in golf? Consistency exists in golf. Uh, what, what exactly? Well, I, you know, one of our one of our friends, Mister Mister John Dunnigan from from Philly, talks yeah. about talks about this quite a bit. And as far as like, there's it's it's really difficult to be. You know, everybody talks about they want more consistency. They want more consistency. You know, the the standard deviation, the bell curve, is going to look the same whether you're averaging 85 or 75. It's just the scores change based off the curve and. You know, that's one of the things like one of the questions I have written down here is like, how do you deal with parent expectations and when you're when their kids are playing bad and all this stuff? And one of the things we talk about, like golf's undefeated, like it's going to win. It's not you're never going to you know, we're never going to going to shoot an 18 on 18 holes. Right. Let's score an 18. You know, how do you kind of deal with that? Because it's that to me, like this parent child relationship and the expectations and, and handling bad play. Like I was my dad was great, but we, we were panickers. So I would panic and go get instruction and go go change something when I was struggling. And I just I needed to realize I need somebody like Hal or you to tell me, hey, you're six, seven and you hit it a long ways. You're going to hit some foul balls and that's OK. And and we don't have to be perfect in every event and we can struggle some and learn from it and then try and be better the next time. And I, I we failed at that. Well, OK, I I believe uh, just oh, now I have an idea of what what you're looking for. Uh, consistency. In performance uh, starts with consistent habits, and, and it starts in the brain, in the mind. Uh, I firmly believe that when I was playing, uh, I, I could not hit a bad golf shot if I was plugged in, right? Because I trained myself to be plugged in, and when I was in that mindset, mindset, I hit good golf shots. You know? And uh, if if I did hit a bad shot, push a drive or something like that, I would just shake my head and laugh and think, well, obviously I wasn't as plugged in as I should have been. 
and and you go back into your routine and you get back in that happy place and now you're hitting it well again. And, and so, Rob, real quick for our listeners, can you def- define plugged in? Yeah. So, okay, I have four different, maybe three or four different levels of, of plugged in. Uh, what most people would call the zone, if they've experienced shooting eight under or ten under, uh, that's uh, for a lot of people. That's it's like nirvana. You're it just it's just you're not thinking about a lot of stuff. You're looking at your target. You're feeling. You can feel everything that's going on. You have a very heightened sense of awareness of where your club is, the speed of it, the, what the face is doing, and you also have awareness of a lot of other things that are going on at the same time, which is amazing. And the balls are going where you want it to go. That your your feel and touch and visualization with the putter is working. Uh, okay, so what's the difference between that state and when it's not going well? And the difference is the way that you're perceiving your, your, your situation in the world. I'll give you an example. I tried to get a U.S. first day of U.S. Open qualifying one year was at my club, semi Miami in the States. And uh, I worked really hard. And it was kind of a cool, wet day and a little bit uh, misty rain. And I really wanted to do this. And, and uh, uh, I was four over after the first four holes. I made four bogeys in a row on my home course. I think at the time I was like a plus three or plus four handicap. And I, what is going on? And so walking from the fourth hole to the fifth hole, I told myself, you know, like your, your mind right now is, is a mess. It's just, I don't know what's going on, but I do know that I change what I'm thinking. So I told myself I was actually not four over par. I was four under par. And how did I feel when I, was four under par after four holes. How did my body, my whole body just went like, whoa. My mind slowed down. My gait changed. My breathing changed. And I pictured myself that the weather was really good instead of cold and crappy. And 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 uh, I made the turn even, to make a long story short. And that was a great lesson. It was a matter of flipping a switch in my brain and going from that negative state into a very, very positive state. Same golfer, same golf swing, nothing wrong with my golf swing. It's just I wasn't allowing myself to trust myself and feel my, feel things the way I normally would. I was trying to. I was pressing. I was trying to birdie every hole and, instead of, you know, being more cool about the whole thing. So that's a very powerful mental experience. I've had lots of these. I've had lots of help from mental coaches over the years. And it, it comes down to uh, when you talk about consistency, uh, I watch – when I'm doing a lesson, I watch very, very carefully to see how structured the pre-shot routine is. Like people don't need to hit thousands and thousands of golf balls. They just don't. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, and that's just the other thing I tell parents when you know, I'm on, on the consistency thing. This child is not old enough yet. Their joint stability, their strength, their experience in life in dealing with situations their experience in playing in a competitive golf situation, the peer pressure, all of these things that are going on, there is no chance that this kid can be super consistent yet. It's impossible. It's swinging a golf club. You know, uh, this is what an 18-year-old, 19-year-old boy looks like or a 19, 17 or 18-year-old girl looks like. And you can watch them on a track band and they'll make 100 swings and the path won't deviate more than one degree or one and a half degrees, let's say. And their attack angle is, is probably within a half you know, with the same club, half a point with the same club all the time. That's consistent. You watch a 10-year-old girl do the same thing. It's not going to be that tight because their body just can't do that yet. And uh, 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 so that's one of the explanations for, for realistic expectations and consistency. Another thing I do, and I actually did this last week, it was a lot of fun. I had this mother that was just, you know, over-the-top helicopter mom trying to push this kid. And this kid has one of the best ball swings. I've ever developed and she goes in a tournament and she just doesn't perform. And I'm obviously thinking there's something going on here. And the mom is trying to coach the heck out of her. So she's at, starts challenging me. Like she has, you know, she, she shoots about 120 when she plays golf. That's what her daughter told me. And you're trying to like, what are you paying me to do this for? If it, it, anyway, end of the day, she came in last week and I gave her a golf lesson. And it changed your life. And like, 
20 minutes. Conceptually, just about everything that she thought she was trying to do by watching YouTube and everything else was misunderstood. And she was trying to give that information to her daughter, not holding stuff and blocking, you know, holding angles and everything. And I got her to release the club and uh, she actually had pretty good golf swing. And she was, she sat, stayed there for about 40 minutes afterwards. And she was just, wow, <laughs> this is so amazing. I can't wait to go play golf. And, and yeah, anyway, it's, it's, um, uh, it, the mind, the mind, like, uh, you know, the mind has to be appealed to when you're doing instruction. Like, I like to ask you, what is it exactly that you think you're supposed to be doing here? Can you show me, like, you're going to teach me, can you show me what your forearms and hands are supposed to be doing during your swing? Can you, can you describe to me how that club is supposed to release? How is it, how is it supposed to square up? What are the, you know, what, what kinds of things are important? In most cases, they can't do it. Now, you would have to say so, well, I'm trying to get them to swing a golf club at, say, 70 miles an hour as a club road, and, and they can't, they, they have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. They have no idea what they're supposed to be feeling. So you've got to kind of break it down a little bit for them. You know Chris Welch? Zeno, Zeno Link, and yep. Yeah, Chris, Chris had a big influence on the way I taught and and uh, he's a sports biomechanist. He's a, a guy who really understands the body. He's a, like a super trainer. Uh, and he also understands the math and the science behind 3D motion analysis. And uh, he's, he talks a lot about patterns of movement that all of us use. And he, he can break those down uh, into simple steps. And I started adopting some of my ideas about teaching based on his ideas and his approach. Um, for example, uh, the foreign concept, how um, probably you both will relate to this. Uh, you get this teenage boy that's coming to you and they're swinging those hands as fast as they can hit it. They're hitting it as hard as they can. And most of them think that the arms and the hands, you know, they're trying to get those hands moving as fast as they can through impact. Hello. Uh, sorry, but your hands are supposed to slow down coming into impact to allow that energy to pass through the club. <laughs> so a huge difference, isn't it, right, in, in thinking. Uh, uh, you can, you know, someone might say, well, you know, you should still feel like you're accelerating, or accelerating your hands through impact. And I'll challenge that. I said, no, you don't have to think that. I understand feel and real. I understand that you think you're hitting down, but your hands are actually moving up. Well, no, they're not. Well, yes, they are. Have a look. You feel like you're forcing the hand pad downward and you're creating lag. And all of a sudden, your body starts standing up on the other side, pulling that handle up, and you're dumping your leg. That's how it happens. It doesn't happen by holding those angles and turning your shoulder down through the ball all the time if you're working efficiently. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think back to the consistency thing, the first step is do you have a good routine? Do you understand the value and the importance of a good routine? Uh, if you stick with that and you keep refining it, you're going to be able to play more consistently. You're never going to play perfectly. You're still going to hit lousy shots sometimes, but most of the time you're going to hit pretty good golf shots. And that's the idea. Instead of, you know, most kids are pretty fragile. They start hitting a couple of bad shots and they start reinventing their golf swing. And before they know it, they're just right out of control. Like we're, they're on tilt, right? And, and you've got to have a way of getting back to your basics. All right, so we cut this one cut this one halfway in the middle. We ran a little long. There was so much good stuff with Rob that we uh, we decided to make this one another uh, another two part two part series. What was your what were your thoughts on the first part? Um, in depth, uh, you know, he gave us more than we could ever ask for. And I think if you're listening and wanting to be better, and especially if you're, he calls it high performance player. And I think that's exactly right. He, he wants people that are dedicated to the game. It's wasting his time. It's wasting your time. It's wasting everybody's money and everything. If you're not that dedicated to it, 
And it, it was fun listening to him talk about that. I mean, it brought back a lot of memories to my junior golf because, you know, I quit everything else and I dedicated myself just to that. He talked about nothing but school and golf. I could relate to that. You can't have balance in your life in terms of all the sports and everything else and be real good at any of them. Man, that's exactly right. And, and keep something in mind again. I mentioned this when he was de- he demonstrated quite a bit for the for the camera. So if you guys got. You know, we're, we're stuck in your car listening to this and wanted to see what he was talking about. Man, check us out on YouTube. Just go, you'll see the video on YouTube. You'll see him talking about the arms and the body and all that stuff. There were some really good little fine points he was making with the demonstrations. It was really, really good. Big stuff there. Y'all enjoy it. So, um, thanks again, as always, for, for checking us out, uh, for listening in. Uh, we'll have part two next week. Um, as always, check us out, House Sutton Golf, HouseSuttonGolf.com, Chase Cooper Golf. Uh, get those questions in get any comments in anything else you'd like to see we're always listening always trying to make it better love doing this chase it's uh, a lot of special things going out there to golfers that want to be better and you know you can't buy it i'm going to tell you real quick it's not for sale and uh it's just going to require a lot of hard work and a lot of knowledge and we're bringing some real knowledgeable people to y'all and rob is one of them so uh Pay attention next week, too, because it gets even more in depth. Be the right club today. Yes!